Hello everyone, this is Mr. Wolf, and we are continuing to read Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607, by Elisa Carbone. We are on to chapter 21. If your king have sent me presents, I also am a king, and this is my land. Eight days I will stay to receive them. Your father, Captain Newport, is to come to me, not I to him, nor yet to your fort. Neither will I bite at such bait. Chief Powhatan, quoted in William Simmons' edition, the proceeding. It is morning when I see Wahun Sonakok, the great Powhatan, for the first time. He is tall and imposing, strong and regal. He wears a necklace of a large piece of copper and many strings of beads. If copper and beads are the Powhatan gold and jewels, he must be truly be wealthy. Captain Smith delivers his message. Will the great chief come to Jamestown to receive his gifts from King James? I see immediately that Captain Smith was right. An emperor should not be invited to come to another town to receive gifts. Chief Powhatan's eyes flash with anger. Your king has sent me presents, he demands. I am also a king, and this is my land. He splays his arms and fingers to show this is all his land. I will wait here eight days to receive the gifts. Captain Newport is to come to me, not I to him. On the hike back to Jamestown, Captain Smith stomps in his anger into the wood pa woodland path. They know nothing, he shouts. Those Virginia Company investors sit in their velvet chairs and dream up what they want to accomplish here. They know nothing of the reality of what it, what is here, and they're going to get us killed. They are idiots. I keep my eyes on the ground, and the soldiers do the same. None of us wants to say a word to Captain Smith when he is this angry. Who ever heard of making an emperor into a prince? He continues. Yet this is what they want. This is what they are trying to do. He kicks a fallen branch out of his way. No good will come of this. Mark my words. No good at all. Back in Jamestown. Captain Smith delivers Chief Powhatan's message. Captain Newport frowns, but he's still determined to obey the orders of the Virginia Company. Chief Powhatan must be crowned a prince under King James. Captain Newport says he would travel to Werewokamoko to accomplish this task. Though the trip is only 12 miles across land, it is much longer by boat. Powhatan's gifts, an English bed, furniture, a copper pot, a wash basin and pitcher, a red cloak, shoes, and that troublesome crown, are loaded onto a barge for the hundred-mile trip down the James River, or the Powhatan River, depending on who you are talking to, into the Chesapeake Bay and up the Pamunkey River to where Wakamoka. Captain Newport and his men return from the coronation a week later. Captain Smith does not even ask them how it all went. He is still fuming. The soldiers who were there tell us the story. Chief Powhatan was asked to kneel to receive his crown. He pretended not to understand. Captain Newport demonstrated the kneeling over and over again until he looked like a marionette on strings and people began to snicker. Still, Chief Powhatan acted like as if he did not understand. He absolutely would not kneel. Captain Smith nods smugly when he hears this. He understood perfectly, he says, and he refused to lower himself. Finally, Captain Newport ordered two soldiers to push down hard on Chief Powhatan's shoulders. This made the chief take one quick tripping step, and in that moment they placed the crown on his head. Then they shot off a round of musket fire to celebrate. Chief Powhatan was now officially a subject 
of King James I of England. He is happy with his new position, Captain Newport says. He gave me his mantle as a gift in return. But another soldier fills us in on the rest. He gave the mantle, and it is a beauty, because he really liked the bed and wash basin, copper pot and what not. But do you know what else he gave Captain Newport? A pair of worn out, sweaty, smelly old moccasins. I'll bet he spit in them too. That's what he thinks of that crown. Let me tell you, Chief Powhatan is a proud emperor. He does not want to be a prince under our King James. Especially not after he has heard from Namantek that King James is short, is a short, flabby, weak man with no teeth and the strongest odour in London. I have a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. It has been all been a big mistake. A mistake we cannot undo. What will happen now? I ask Captain Smith. Trouble, he says, his anger smoldering. Trouble that we will have to bear. While the fools who gave these orders sit in their comfortable homes in London, and while Captain Newport sails safely back to England. The first thing we get is not trouble, but a wedding. Anne has permission to marry and she has said yes to John Layden. I am convinced she made a good choice. One night, when it rained so hard all our cabins were flooding, John Layden was outside Master and Mistress Forrest's cabin, where Anne lives, digging a trench instead of trying to save his own cabin from the flood. I believe he will be a good husband to her. We gather in the chapel. Anne in her burgundy Sunday petticoat and yellow bodice, and John in his just-washed shirt and a blue doublet. Reverend Hunt performs the service, and we have a good meal afterwards, with several chickens sacrificed for the celebration. The trees surround us with their fall leaves and blazes of red and orange and yellow, as if they too are celebrating the first English wedding in the New World. Reverend Hunt is in good spirits for the wedding, but he has been feeling poorly off and on for months now. It is as if the summer sickness never left him. He has headaches and fevers that sometimes send him to his bed. A few days after the wedding, Reverend Hunt takes to his bed again. Richard takes good care of him, but I also check on him every often to see if he needs water or food or other comfort. I wonder if there is something some food or herb or medicine that I can bring him that will heal him this time the way the eggs and meat and wine healed him before. One day when I check on him, he asks me for some water. His hands shake as he takes the goblet from me. He drinks, then looks me in the eye. Samuel, you will not always be a servant, he says. You will do something far greater than that. I'm surprised by this sudden announcement. I shake my head. I'm an orphan, the son of dead peasants. Of course I will always be a servant. What else could I be, I wonder? You must learn from what you see around you, he says. Learn from Captain Smith, President Smith. Do you know why he is like well liked as president, while well, President Wingfield and President Ratcliffe were not? I know the answer, because I have already thought about it. It is because Captain Smith cares about all of us, I say. The other leaders only c cared only for their own comfort, and their own gain, and for the gain of a few of their friends. Reverend Hunt nods. Good, you are already learning. This is important for you to remember, because I will not always be here to remind you. He lies back down and closes his eyes. But if I will not always be a servant, what will I be? I ask. Could I be a soldier? Even an officer like Captain Smith? Reverend Hunt smiles with his eyes closed. You will see, he says. 
remember what we have talked about here and remember that you will always know the right decision because it is when you choose from love. He looks as if he has talked enough. I take a rag and wring it out in a bowl of cool water and lay it on his forehead. He is so pale and seems so weak. It is the worst I have seen him. His chest feels heavy with sadness. My chest feels heavy with sadness. Reverend Hunt was the first person I opened my heart to after it was closed up tight when my mom died. I can't stand to see life slipping away from him like this. I wonder if I might lay my hands on his head and pray and keep his soul from leaving his body the way he did for me so many months ago. But I realize if God is ready to take Reverend Hunt up to heaven, it is not my business to try and stop him. Would you like some supper? I ask Reverend Hunt quietly. He shakes his head slightly. I touch his hand and leave him to rest. Reverend Hunt does not leave his bed again. Richard and I keep a vigil, one or the other of us checking on him each hour. Finally, he stops asking for food or water and wants only to lie still. I know it is my last chance to speak to him. I go in the evening, light a candle, and kneel by his bed. Reverend Hunt, I whisper. He opens his eye f eyes for a moment and nods. I know he is listening. What do I want to say? Don't leave. Please stay. Pray for another miracle. I shake my head to stop these thoughts. He is leaving, I tell myself firmly. You can't stop it. Reverend Hunt, thank you for teaching me, I say. I force myself to talk past the lump in my throat. Thank you for treating me like I was worth something. The day we bury Reverend Hunt, it is rainy and cold. My feet sink into the mud at the gravesite. Richard stands with me, both of us silent. They shoot off the cannons in Reverend Hunt's honor. A great man has gone to his reward in heaven. And that is the end of chapter 21.